Why don't you turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 1. We've been going through the book of Timothy um, in our regular Sunday teaching, and there are two wonderful gospel statements in the first two chapters, and it only seemed appropriate that coming Easter now we would focus on those a little more closely. So our text today is simply 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15. Being Easter, and particularly Good Friday, the message is usually slightly less expositional um, and somewhat more devotional, and we trust and pray that that will be the case for our hearts this morning. So I'm going to read for us that verse, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. It is true that um, we all appreciate and find it good when we are in a position that we qualify for something. Um, something of importance or of value. Um, For example, back in school, and those who are in school, if you made the cut for the first team, whether it was first team rugby or first team chess, if you made the cut and qualified, um, that was a good thing. Or perhaps it's qualifying for a bursary in order to study at at university, that is as well a, a great benefit. Or perhaps you have a certain medical condition and you happen to qualify for a clinical trial, um, which may mean free medicine and a solution to what has been a persisting ailment. Or maybe simply you qualify for a promotion at work and um, that means greater income and greater financial freedom. Though some of us, I realize, may not have been quite so lucky, and we never quite made the cut for first-team rugby at school, and perhaps we never quite got the bursary we hoped for in order to study what we wanted, and maybe we're still waiting for that promotion at work, and it hasn't yet come. But I have some good news for you this morning particularly if you are in the latter category, that we all qualify here today for the greatest benefits and the greatest blessing of all time. We all qualify for salvation because we're all sinners. That's exactly what this verse says, doesn't it? that this saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. I could ask you to to put your hand up, but I won't. You know, by show of hands, how many of you here this morning are a sinner? And we will find that at least 99.5% of us will have our hands up and qualify, therefore, for this greatest of all benefits. We qualify for salvation. R.C. Sproul, um, the late R.C. Sproul, um, in the tact and sharpness that he, he often spoke and commented with, makes this observation. Admittedly, the church is full of sinners. In fact, I know of no other organization in the world that requires a person to be a sinner in order to join it. Now, jokes aside, um, being a sinner is nonetheless a serious situation or condition. Because when we speak about sin, we are, are not simply referring to the fact that we break some of the laws of God. It is more than that. When we say that we, we are sinners or, or that we are sin, we're actually saying that we are rejecting the rule of God. 
And there is a difference. It is this, that, that, that sin, therefore, is not just something that we do with our hands. But sin, in fact, is something that we are in our hearts. It's as the Bible says in Romans chapter 1, verse 21, for example. For although they, that, that's all of us, although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. You see, there it is. We, we do know better, but in fact we choose not to act accordingly. That in other words, sin is actually this bad. It is actually rebellion against God. It is not simply like a passive or, or accidental thing, something that I do in a weak moment or, or something that I do simply because there's too much stress and pressure on me. And while there may be external circumstances that aggravate our tendency to sin, which we call temptation, nonetheless the buck stops with you and me, and that our sin comes from our hearts. That at the end of the day, our sin is deliberate, and with that can rightly be described as an act of defiance toward God. Because simply this, what sin means is that we choose to live our own way rather than God's way. That's the bottom line. And, and what makes that situation so serious is the fact that God has made us, that He has made us for Himself, first of all, that He is the Creator. We are His. But, but more so, He has created us, especially as we know, he, he has made us in the image of God, that we might, what? Reflect God. That we might indeed live for Him and serve Him. And yet we don't, you see, making sin all the more serious, as perhaps the most well-known reference to sin in the Bible, Romans 3 verse 23 describes, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You see, that's our biggest problem, is that we fail as God's image bearers to reflect His glory making sin a great travesty. Making sin not simply acts that are commit of lying or lusting that affect relationships horizontally. No, much more so and much more seriously, every sin affects the, the reality of a relation, relationship that I have vertically, my relationship with God. Every sin is an act against God. It is, if you like, cosmic treason. And so the question then is, if, if that is sin, what happens to the mouse who steals the lion's food? Well, there are consequences, aren't there? That our sin before such a God is not without consequence. And so while we all find ourselves qualifying as sinners um, and recognizing the position that that puts us in, we are so thankful then to read of this verse where we are told that the reason Jesus came was then to save sinners, was then to save us. And so we Paul writes here that um, this saying is trustworthy and, full exist, and worthy of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. This word to save has so much meaning and such rich implication because we could speak forever about the magnitude and the depth of this salvation that God 
has provided for us. Because clearly what it means most basically, if we are sinners and our sin before God is of such dire consequence, then the salvation must mean at least that we are saved from the sin before God. And so what kind of salvation do we sinners need? Well, essentially this, we need forgiveness. We need our sin before God cleared. You see, we are guilty and we need to be made right before God. And the thing is, God could never just in His kindness or in His love, if we ask nicely enough, forgive us. He couldn't do that. Because, as I've hinted at, our sin has incurred a penalty and a, and a punishment that needs to be paid. You see, our sin, in fact, puts us in this position of not just being unrighteous before God, but of being condemned by God. As J.R. Packer writes, men are opposed to God in their sin, which we have seen, and God is opposed to men in His holiness. And so therefore God cannot simply bend the law and say it's okay. He cannot simply turn a blind eye. And so that is why Jesus came for us, as Paul says here so plainly. That He came especially as we've been singing and meditating on to die for us. Yes, to take God's punishment for our sin, in our place, so that we might be made acceptable to God. So as to take away the condemnation that hangs over us because of sin. As Peter writes, Christ died for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that He might bring us to God. And so the big word that really lies at the heart of, of this salvation that, that God has provided for us in sending Jesus who came for sinners like us is this glorious truth, and he has the big theological word, of justification. That, that what Jesus came in paying the punishment for our sin was to therefore enable us to be declared right with God. No longer at enmity with God, no longer under condemnation. We have been made right with God through Jesus, the righteous, dying for the unrighteous. And so on the cross that we've remembered it was a legal transaction, not least of all, that went down. That on the cross, our legal debt was settled. The rightful demands of the law were satisfied. By Jesus dying in our place. By the judge himself, God and Christ, Becoming the judged. And so while we all qualify for this salvation as sinners, and while this salvation has, has come to us through Jesus Christ, it came at great cost, it came at great suffering. That, that where, it, where it just says Jesus Christ came, behind that is so much more of what it cost as we've been reflecting on this morning. And perhaps before we, we pass over it too quickly, thinking that Christ came to save us, and before we minimize the extent and the magnitude of the feat that it was, Songwriter and musician Matt Papa, in an abbreviated style, captures something for us of the magnitude of this 
life-saving events, of how Jesus exactly provided the salvation for us sinners, that it was through suffering. He writes, well, glory knew his time had come. A solemn dawn, a colder sun. With holy furrowed brow, he knew somehow that this day was the moment. Upon his feet, a face of flint. The race thus far was perfect, but he must finish. This weary God, weary from almighty strain, grief suddenly surging upon his frame. He steps away to the place where men are broken and men are made, the crucible, Gethsemane, heart beating, foster breathing, sweating, bleeding, begging, pleading, my father, what are we seeing? A God weeping, a king pleading, a lamb bleating. The one who uttered the world, now speechless. The one who slept through a storm, now sleepless. The torture's approaching, the torture ensuing. A poison kiss, face of flint. Thrown to the ground and pushed and mocked, hail, king of the Jews. He utters not a word. Punched, repeated, kicked, mistreated, wounded, flogged, and torn and beaten. Innocent, see him. As torturers, blind, took him away to the place of the skull. Where for a moment, time stood still as glory prepares for the final sprint. A beam laid on his freshly ploughed back and shoulder. He carried our shame, our idolatry boulder. Nails were driven. Father, forgive them. Lifted to heaven, completely abandoned. My God, my God, why? Lift your face, don't look away as he suffers to raise his tattered frame. He arches his back, takes a difficult breath, and says, it is finished. And he bows his head, and darkness covered all the land. And against the backdrop of grossest evil, glory shone like the sun with no equal. Salvation had come, and sweet forgiveness, it is finished, it is finished. Behold the Lamb, God's only Son. The race is run, the work is done, it is finished. And so Christ came as such to suffer in order to provide the salvation that we need as sinners. Peter Jeffrey writes that no sin is excusable. But thank God, through Christ, it is pardonable. And how complete this pardon is. How full this forgiveness is. As Jesus could say, it is finished. That his suffering brought us perfect and complete security. And that is why Paul can argue in, in Romans chapter 8, as he does, where he says, so, And so who shall bring any charge against God's elect? For it is God who justifies. And, and who is it to condemn? Well, Christ Jesus is the one who died, and, and more than that was raised, and who is at the right hand of God, and, and who is interceding for us. And so this justification that has been accomplished for us is complete and once and for all and, and perfect and whole. 
That for those who are in Christ, no one can, can any longer bring a charge against you. Because the payment has indeed been made in full. The condemnation has indeed been completely removed. That God Himself has issued the verdict upon us. That through Christ, we are forgiven. That through Christ, we are saved. It is as the hymn writer puts into words for us and into poetry, see the destined day arise. See a willing sacrifice. Jesus, to redeem our loss, hangs upon the shameful cross. Jesus, who but you could bear wrath so great and justice fair, every pang and bitter throw, finishing your life of woe. Who but Christ has dared to drain, steeped in gall the cup of pain, and with tender body bear thorns and nails and piercing spear. Slain for us the water flowed, mingled from your side with blood, signed to all attesting eyes of the finished sacrifice. And so the question we are left to ask this morning, as sinners who have been provided this salvation at such great cost through Jesus' suffering, but nonetheless in totality giving us complete security. Have we appreciated what it means that Christ Jesus came to save sinners? It is true that we can fall into a deep hole and, and break our leg. And we appreciate immediately our need for help, don't we? And we will scream and, and we will shout. Or if we lock ourselves in a room, we appreciate again our, our need for help and we, we bang on the door and, and we, we shout, get me out. But what is true is that we are much less aware of our much greater need of spiritual help. And even much less willing to admit it, much less willing to, to cry out for, for help and, and say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. There's a wonderful story in the Old Testament, in the Bible, um, the story about Naaman, who was the chief commander of the army of the nation of Syria. And they, Syria had conquered Israel um, and had taken captives. And one of those captives was, as you know, a young girl. Naaman suffered, though, a, a terrible disease despite all his might and power that he could do nothing himself to heal. And that was he suffered from leprosy. And one day this Jewish girl had the bravery and the kindness of heart to mention that if only this man Naaman would go to, to Israel and see the prophet there to be healed. And so eventually out of desperation, Naaman took this girl's advice and took all his, his soldiers and some of his close men and traveled back to Israel and to Jerusalem in order to find this prophet to get healed. And he stops, of course, at the temple and finds that he is not there and is rerouted to the outskirts of town into a very ordinary house where the prophet Elisha stayed. Already slightly annoyed that he has to travel so much further, King Nahum arrives at Elijah's home, Elisha's home, should I say. And upon arriving there, Elisha sends out just a messenger with the orders of instruction for Naaman to follow. Namely, that he is to jump into the Jordan River and wash himself seven times. By now, the king is beyond frustrated. 
and annoyed and in fact angry that he has come, Naaman has, with all his might and with all his power, um, expecting not least of all to find the prophet in a place of great significance like a temple, expecting not least of all for the prophet himself to at least come out and maybe speak a mighty word over Naaman with some great incantation and find that Naaman would be healed. But there was none of that. In fact, all he's told is to go and cleanse himself in the dirty Jordan River, to which Naaman responds, but our rivers back home are even cleaner and clearer and um, more beautiful than this river. And so he decides he's wasting his time and he gets everyone together and he makes his way back home. But the servants who are with him say, Naaman, you have come so far. Surely this man must be of some reputation. Is it not worth trying what he has suggested? And eventually Naaman relents and capitulates and realizes, well, he has nothing to lose. He has no other option. And so Naaman does this rather obscure and seemingly ungratifying act of cleansing himself seven times in the Jordan River. And as he comes out the seventh time, what does he realize? His skin is soft like a baby's and white like snow. And so marvel of marvels, he has been cleansed and he has been healed. Not through any expected mighty act of deliverance, not through some mighty ritual and formula, but simply by the king eventually, eventually, having to set aside his great pride and willingly and humbly be washed in the Jordan River. That, that Naaman had to come to this point of, of utter surrender, of utter helplessness, that even though this made no sense to him, it was the only option. And so what a picture Naaman is of exactly what we need to do in appreciating this salvation. That we need to set aside our pride and any sense of worth, any sense of righteousness, and come humbly and come empty and see through this act of the cross, through this death of Jesus Christ, that there and there alone do we find forgiveness, do we find cleansing from a much greater disease than leprosy. The disease of sin and all its eternal consequences. Incredible that the way Jesus came to us is the way we need to come to Him. And so this morning, perhaps, God is just saying to you and reminding you that can you believe it that you've qualified for the greatest prize ever? That as a sinner, you qualify for salvation. You may not have made much else of your life in this world. You may not have gotten all what you had hoped to achieve in this world. You may not have been recognized in the ways you had hoped to be recognized. But of far surpassing significance is this, is that as a sinner, having come to Christ in repentance and faith, you have qualified for the greatest of all gifts. You have qualified for salvation. And maybe we have, though, taken that for granted, and maybe God is this morning calling us to humble ourselves before Him. To be broken before Him. To have our hearts softened before Him. To come in repentance and to come in faith. And then this is what we are reminded of as a result of the forgiveness that we receive as Isaiah writes, and so I, 
will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for He has clothed me with garments of salvation, and He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. Let us pray. Our God and Father, how we do thank You this morning for this great blessing, this great gift of righteousness, of forgiveness, of justification, that we are now declared right before you, that we now have salvation full and complete. And so how we pray, O oh God, we would that we would in our hearts again know that the joy that is ours is a joy of salvation that no one can take away and that nothing can diminish. Restore unto us the joy of our salvation as David prayed as he came in confession to you for his great sin. Grant us that, O God, this day, the joy of our salvation. In Jesus' name, amen.